Walking into my local bottle shop, I'm amazed at all the different places all the great craft beer comes from. Whether it's a solid import section from Europe, Mexico, and Japan, or beers from almost every corner of the United States, it's really cool to see beer from all around the world showcased in my own little corner of the planet. And while I like trying all these beers from faraway lands, one of the major drawbacks to the import section is the higher price tags when compared to the local brews. Between extended shipping costs and import duties, I expect I'm going to be paying a higher price for these brews. But one brand of beer seems to defy all of this logic because even though it's from a pretty obscure location, it's priced very similarly to local craft brews of similar quality. I am of course talking about the widely available Hawaiian beer brand Kona Brewing Company and their portfolio of beer offerings. But how in the world do they manage to accomplish this? Think about it, they would have to import all their brewing ingredients to the Aloha State as it's much too warm to grow hops and barley. And then they'd have to brew the beer importing all the equipment and packaging materials. And then they have to ship the beer to the mainland US while keeping it pretty fresh and then put it on a truck and get it distributed all the way up here to snowy Minnesota where I live. How do they not have a ton of extra costs over the other national brands that have such an easier journey? Well the answer to this brain teaser is simple and involves one of the brewing industry's dirty little secrets. That's right, today we're talking about contract brewing. Hey this is Ryan with Beer by the Numbers and brewing beer is more of a local industry here in the US than it's ever been before. The US just passed the 7,000 brewery mark, and to me it seems like there's a Starbucks and a craft brewery on every corner. But have you ever been to a brewery that seems really small and barely has any production space, but they managed to keep 8 taps worth of beer rotating and supply all the local bottle shops? Well that's because brewers large and small often contract out some of their production to third party brewing facilities to do some of their work. These contract breweries work with brewers to give them a boost in production if they don't have the space or are in a different location to reduce their shipping costs. So let's take a look at this important piece of the brewing supply chain here in the US. Where did contract brewers come from? How many of them are there and are there any drawbacks to contracting out your production? Leave a like below for some great beer content and let's get started. After Prohibition here in the United States, only a few hundred brewing companies managed to weather the storm and restart their operation. These breweries were ready to crank out some great beers, but all the marketing work and great branding that existed before Prohibition now didn't hold a lot of sway in consumers' minds. For many brewers who were barely scraping by, it was much harder to relaunch a brand, build consumer trust, and fight for market share with other desperate breweries. So for many brewery owners, they took an easier route contracting their brewing capacity out to other established brands to get a piece of their already successful branding. As a strategy for keeping your brewery operating, this worked pretty well. For many brewers, it gave them a much larger buyer to sell to, and although their margins may have been a little lower, their marketing and sales costs were almost non-existent. But the next 50 years saw significant consolidation in the brewing industry in the United States, and many of these independent contract brewers were caught up in that wake. As brands like Miller, Coors, and Budweiser came to dominate the industry, they began snatching up all these contract breweries in order to expand their own production very quickly. As such, by the 1980s there were very few independent breweries left to take contracts in the United States. But like most beer history stories we tell here in the United States, Everything began to change with the lifting of the ban on homebrewing in 1978. Suddenly there were all sorts of great homebrewers popping up who wanted to take their craft to a commercial scale, but in the 80s that was way easier said than done. Banks and investors at the time weren't exactly excited to get into the beer business, and who could blame them? We take for granted that craft breweries are a successful business model today, but back then you'd be hard pressed to find an example of an independent brewery much less a successful or well-known one. So what are entrepreneurial homebrewers like Jim Coke to do? Coming from a family of brewers, Jim Coke developed a really great Vienna lager recipe at home and wanted to take his Boston lager to a commercial scale. Now, he could have spent months and years trying to secure a million dollars plus of funding, apply for a ton of permits, uh, find and construct a space, and then finally get into the brewing, but he found a more clever solution. 
Instead of going through the brewery startup process, a process that really didn't have a great model to follow in the 80s, he went to one of the few remaining contract brewers left, the Pittsburgh Brewing Company. They took his great recipe and began cranking out a lot of Sam Adams Boston lager. And instead of worrying about starting and running a brewery, Jim could focus on selling and marketing his product to the drinking public. Although it was a little bit awkward for the first few years that Boston Lager was being brewed in Pittsburgh, it was pretty clear that Jim had a hit on his hands. And with that success, he turned his company into the largest craft brewery in the United States. And this story of using a contract brewer to get a craft beer brand off the ground became increasingly common over the next 20 years. Many craft beer brands got their start with beer made in a facility that they didn't own proving a quick way to profitability that made investors and banks more confident in lending money to new beer startups. Perhaps a bit ironically, the craft beer revolution that is so focused on locally produced beer today has its heritage in outsourcing production to get your brewery off the ground. That's why I find the stigma against contract breweries to supplement the production of little breweries a little bit strange. For many drinkers, using a contract brewer seems like cheating, or at the very least that they may as well consider the beer a product of the contractor rather than the local brewer or beer maker. And I get it, US craft brewers are fiercely independent, and many are quite critical of the marketing and production practices of the large mega brewers. Contracting out production is definitely something those large brewers would want to do. But as more and more people learn about the greater beer ecosystem here in the United States, the negative stigma is slowly dissipating, and there are several reasons why. Like we looked at already, contract brewers have allowed many great craft breweries to get off the ground without having to raise a million plus dollars in capital first. But some craft breweries use contract brewers long after they've initially started. See, even if you have your own brewing space, it can be hard to keep a constant and engaging rotation of beers. In today's marketplace, craft consumers value variety, so you'd have a tough time getting by just making three or four great beers. Even if a beer lover enjoys your product over many competitors, the craft consumer can quickly lose interest in having the same beer over and over. And if you're a small brewery with limited capacity, keeping drinkers interested in your lineup becomes a real challenge. So working with a contract brewer to add more variety to your beer rotation is a no-brainer for many small breweries with limited capacity. So new breweries and small breweries use contract brewers to provide more options to the drinking public. Always a good thing in my opinion. But some of the more discerning palates often criticize contract brewers for a lack of quality. This criticism isn't exactly unfounded either. Turning over your recipe and brewing techniques to another entity that isn't quite as invested in your success can be dangerous. But as consumers in the US have come to care more about the quality of their beer, the contract brewers have stepped up their game. There was a great interview in Paste Magazine in which the owner of a contract brewer, Beltway Brewing, talked about their quality control processes. Each of our clients has a varying level of involvement, but the majority of them are extremely involved. We have a very tedious brewing review process procedure to make sure that weeks in advance, we are 100% clear on exactly how a brew is made. From milling, to mashing, to brewing, to fermentation, to dry hopping, to centrifugation, to carbonation, to packaging. Through the process, of course, we offer our two cents based on our experience and expertise, which our clients can take or leave. We really do see it as more of a collaboration to varying degrees, with the brand owners having the final say on the creative direction. For that reason, we really have not had any clients that are anything but completely upfront about their partnership with Beltway. Transparency and collaboration are the factors that are increasingly important with a brewer-contractor relationship in the modern beer marketplace. But that last sentence of the quote does bring up a good point about contract brewers that is often criticized. It can create a cloudy marketing situation some people are happy to take advantage of. For example, you might think your local neighborhood brewery is a really impressive bunch as they manage to keep 12 beers rotating through their tiny taproom, but in reality, Half or more of their beer is produced off-site by a brewer who cares much more about money than that individual brand itself. 
and some beer brands don't even have breweries at all. They are produced entirely in production facilities owned by someone else. You might be drinking a great beer named after a local landmark, but that beer was actually produced hundreds of miles away. And while there's nothing inherently wrong with that, some people who want to focus on buying and drinking locally may feel a bit jaded when they learn that Boston Lager was actually brewed in Pittsburgh. But as long as the brands are open and honest about how their beers are produced, I don't see any problem using contract brewers to give drinkers more choices. So while contract brewing certainly has some drawbacks, and it can create some marketing ambiguity, ultimately they are an important part of the beer industry in the United States. They allow brewers to give consumers more options and keep prices down by lowering distribution costs over long distances. So long as brewers continue to work towards greater transparency, I wholly expect contract breweries and their customer breweries to be very successful into the future. What do you think of contract brewing in general? Know any good or bad stories about them? Let me know down in the comments section below. Once again, this has been Ryan with Beer by the Numbers, and I'll be back next week with more outsourced beer content.